Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. This, dear friends, was the man Philip Gentry, or Reverend Pierce, or whatever other name he may choose in eternity. The man whom we bury today. That night when he stood above my bed, pouring defiance and bitterness into my ears, thinking that I was paralyzed, I could both speak and write. My paralysis had been gone for many days. But I did not speak, because I knew what Philip Gentry would do, what he had to do, criminal and murderer though he was. Each week at this hour, Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, Beyond Good and Evil, starring Peter Lorre, brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Yes, try a camel. Let your T-zone decide. That's tea for taste and tea for throat. Your proving ground for any cigarette. Let your T-zone decide if camels' rich, full flavor and cool mildness aren't just made to order for enjoyment. Yes, try a camel. And be sure to have a carton of camels on hand for the long weekend coming up. Why, Reverend Pierce. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. Is Reverend McKillop still awake? Oh, yes. We don't put him to bed until later, later. Is evening service over already? Is it over? <laughs> Shame on you, Lucy, a parson's daughter, and you forget there is no service on Wednesdays. Of course. You've come to read to Father. Well, there's so little I can do. Uh, if he were able to let us know in some way, I know. can tell by his eyes. Whenever you're here, they fairly glow. Oh, I, I suppose that helpless as he is, not able to speak or even to write, my... My visits are at least a diversion. You're much more than a diversion. Mm. You're his hope. No, Lucy. The Lord is his hope. Oh, yes. The Lord struck him down with paralysis, and, and in time the Lord will surely free him from it. Well, I'll go in and try to cheer him up. Good evening, Reverend McKillop. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Yes, McKillop, you hang on my every word, and, and you never talk back. You never have, except once, and, and after tonight you won't get the chance. Huh? Speak up, Reverend, why don't you? No, of course, the cat's got your tongue, huh? Yes, tonight is your last chance, Reverend. Tonight is the consummation, finished, the end, act three curtain, on a great play about death and redemption, about good and evil. And I won't shrink from your eyes, McKillop, see? Your eyes can't kill, but I can kill. I have the mind and the will and the hands. I've killed one man, that you know. And tonight, tonight I'm going to kill again. <laughs> Yes, Reverend McKillop, you know who I was before I became the Reverend Howard Pierce, pastor of this good and godly community. And you know my real name, it's Philip Gentry, but, but you never knew the soul of Philip Gentry, the, the contempt, the sum of evil that was in me that night it all began. Yes, it's, it's now three months ago. What a stormy night. I, I was crouching in a swamp with a man named Mac. 
because we had just escaped from prison, hiding like animals in the deep mud and ooze, alien from the whole entire human race. Sentry, where are you going? To the highway, you idiot. Got to make time before daylight. Yeah. Before the rain stops. Yeah. They bring out the bloodhounds in the morning. Yeah, okay, okay, you're the boss. There's the highway now. There, yeah. beyond the fence. Well, so what do we do now? Where do we go? It's played up. I'll meet you in Chicago later. Yeah, at Gus's place? Yes, at Gus's place in two or three weeks when a manhunt cools on. You, you won't let me down, will you, Gentry? I said I'll meet you. Now get moving. Go on, fast. <laughs> And then I saw a car. It, it was parked close to the edge of the road. Its, its headlights almost blacked out by the rain. And, and then, by the glow of what I knew was a flashlight, I, I saw a man bending into the rain, struggling to change a tire. He, he was alone, so I walked up to him. Hello. Sir? Sir? Need help? Oh, oh, you startled me. I'm sorry. I didn't expect to see anyone this late. Picked a bad night for a flat. Eh? Yes, and it's the second today. I'm going to be awfully late. Here, uh, come on, let me help. Oh, no, 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 thank you. But if you would hold the light. Oh, sure. Yeah. Come a long way? Uh, yes, from Detroit. I, I'm on my way to Carlton. I was Carlton. supposed to get there this afternoon. I'm the new minister there. Uh, my name's Pierce. Didn't notice you were a preacher. Yes, I'm taking over for old Reverend McKillop at Grace Church. Reverend He's McKillop. been in Grace bad health, Church. so I'm taking his place. Yes. Oh, my, this, this boat is stubborn. I, I, I can't seem to get it. To Come on, let me have the wrench. Uh, no, no, really, just, just hold the light. I said give me the wrench. Well, all right, it's awfully good of you. Come on, give it to me. No, 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 no wait. I need wait, what are you going to do? No, please. no, You please. are going to be please. even later no. than you thought. No. Oh, be quiet, no. you... Hit him twice, and I can't tell you now, Reverend McKillop, what I thought when it wrenched Bick into flesh and bone. Or I swear to you that it was not my intention to kill, and and yet I, I did. I, I killed. Yes, when I put my hand on his chest, the heart had stopped, and and the Reverend Howard Pierce was dead. Reverend Pierce was dead. <laughs> Very dead, so so I buried him. I buried him in my prison clothes, and soon I I was dressed in his clothes. Oh, I had on his decent black and turned around collar, and, and I was rolling this way. And at the city limits of Carlton, my own destiny stepped in. I was stopped by a traffic cop. Let me see your license, buddy. A license? Oh, yeah, I... I'm a, here. Here it is. Uh, Howard Pierce. Occupation. Hmm? Oh, minister. <laughs> I didn't notice. Well, what is it, officer? Was I speeding? No, no, we're checking all cars on this road. There was a break at the state pen. Two prisoners escaped. Yes. They might come this way. I see but I won't hold you up any longer, Reverend. You uh, going far? Oh, no. Uh, Carlton. Well, say, this is Carlton. It is? <laughs> oh, yes, there's the sign. Say, I get it. <laughs> Imagine me not catching on right away. Catching on? Sure, you oh. must be the new preacher for Grace Church. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> well, I'm Charlie Owen. I, oh, I yeah. sing in the Grace Church choir, baritone. Oh. Uh... You going to the parsonage now? Yes, I was. Well, it's a little tricky finding it. I'm going into headquarters now, and I have to go right by Reverend McKillop's house. Oh, that's nice. You follow me. Thank you, son. It's very nice of you. Hello there, Lucy. Why, hello, Charlie. Guess who I'm delivering to you? It's Reverend Pierce. He's just getting out of the car. Who are you expecting, Lucy? The boyfriend? You mean my fiancé, Mr. Tom Hubbard? <laughs> when are you two going to get married, anyway? You know, everybody in... Oh, here's Reverend Pierce. Uh, Reverend Pierce, here's Lucy, Reverend McKillop's daughter. 
How do you do? Oh, come in, come in, Reverend Pierce. Thank Father you. and I have been so worried. We expected you all afternoon. Oh, I had two flat tires. Oh, what a shame. Well, Father's waiting up for you in his study. Father, Charlie Owen brought Reverend Pierce. Reverend Pierce? Well, come in, come in. Uh, you and Mr. Owen wait outside for a few minutes, Lucy. All right, sure, Father. Sure, sir. <laughs> Sit over here, Reverend Pierce. Thank you, sir. I can't tell you how relieved I am to see you. I really couldn't bring myself to sleep tonight without first talking to you. You see, the situation's serious. Seems serious. Why, Reverend? My health. I'm a sick man. I've had one stroke as I wrote you. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, I could have another one at any time. Okay. The doctor says a worse one. And I feel it essential that the work of the parish should be in firm hands. This parish needs a young man. Why, well, I hope to be of service, sir. I've heard only good of you, Reverend Pierce. Thank you. And you know you're even younger than you look. Oh, really? In the picture you sent. Uh, mm. Darker, too. Your, your hair. I'm afraid it, uh, it wasn't a very good like. I have the picture here somewhere on my desk with your letters. What did you want uh, to talk to me about, Reverend McKillop? Oh, all the work of the parish. Oh, oh yes, here's the photograph. It's, uh, uh Something Reverend wrong, Pierce. Reverend McKillop? It's not... Who are you? Not what? This isn't your picture. Who are you? I don't think that should interest you. It's so Something's happened, Reverend, Reverend Pierce. McKillop. What did you do to him? You're... What, you're... what do you think I did, uh, Reverend McKillop? Huh? Uh, Come on, go on, guess. Guess, don't you hear me? Come on, don't you play with me, you... You sanctimonious fool, you... Come on, speak up. Speak up. What's the matter with you? Oh, don't tell me you had another stroke, huh? That's all right. You, you can't speak, huh? Is that it? Well, I'll find out. And in any case, I'll take that picture of Reverend McKillop. And, and now, if Reverend you don't... Reverend Pierce, we talk... Oh. Yes, Lucy, uh, something has happened to your father. We we were talking and... Is it? Yes, uh, I'm afraid it's another stroke. He, he can't speak and apparently he can't move. Father. Father. What can we do? Lucy, we, we'll have to wait for the doctor and, and maybe even then. I know. The doctor said he could be paralyzed for months, years. But he mustn't die. No, no. If we have faith, the Lord will spare him. And, and until the good Lord returns his health, uh, I'll try to shepherd his flock. <laughs> Yes, and, and since that first time, Reverend McKillop, you've never opened your mouth again. Oh, you can stare, yes. Stare as hard as you want. That doesn't bother me. Because your stare cannot kill, but, but I, as you know, I can. And I will, Reverend McKillop. <laughs> Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air when camels present Act Two of Beyond Good and... Ask a sports champ in any field what helped him most toward success, and he'll probably say experience. Yes, experience is the best teacher. Take bronc riding champ Jerry Ambler. His most recently won sports crown is the Saddle Bronc Championship of the World. Experience? Why, say, Jerry's been riding Bronx for 18 years. Yes, as he recently said, Experience is the best teacher. In Bronx riding and in smoking, too. A cigarette for me is camel. And there, Jerry's like thousands and thousands of other cigarette smokers who smoke just about all the different brands during the wartime cigarette shortage. Well... Experience like that was bound to make people experts in judging the differences in cigarette quality. And on the basis of that experience, thousands and thousands of people decided they liked camels best. 
Yes, they learned that for rich, full flavor and cool mildness, the cigarette for them is camel. As a result, more people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. Reverend McKillop, aging, paralyzed, unable to speak, listens helplessly as Philip Gentry, criminal and murderer, explains why he killed Reverend Pierce and assumed Pierce's clothes and identity and describes his first sermon. And so in conclusion, dear friends, remember the agony of our Lord was shared by two thieves. And they were crucified beside him that he might be numbered among the transgressors. And remember his words to one. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. <coughs> now we will sing hymn 426, Just as I am without one plea. was my first sermon, Reverend McKillop. Oh, I saw your eyes when Lucy told you how, how deeply moved the congregation was. Oh, you couldn't understand, you just couldn't, how such a thing could be done without faith. Oh, but, but I have been a lawyer, and, and I have done a lot without faith. Yes, I have been the ideal parson you were looking for. I, oh, I wish you could ask young Hubbard... Uh, you don't know he called on me, huh? Reverend Pierce? Yes? I missed your first service, Reverend. I thought I ought to pay you a call. My name's Hubbard. Oh, yes, I know, I know. You're in a choir. Come on. Come in, Mr. Hubbard. Make yourself comfortable. Oh, thank you. What's your business, Mr. Hubbard? Uh, I work at the bank. I'm chief teller. Chief teller? What a very responsible job for a young man like you. I suppose it is, but... I don't have much more responsibility than the other tellers, except at the end of the month. Oh. Then it's a strain. End of the month? Why? Well, sure, that's when I have to... Yes? <sighs> you know, I, I've never told anyone about oh, this. Please. And... So even with you, well, I... if it's confidential. Well, no, no, naturally not, so far as you're concerned, Reverend oh, Pierce. Um, you see, the 30th of the month, we move all our deposits to the Federal Reserve Bank. Yes. Um, $200,000 or more, so... You can see how I wouldn't want some people to know that. You mean you, you have to take the deposits alone? To... Oh, no. No, gosh, no. That'd be even worse than it is. No, there's an armored truck that oh, comes to well, take the money. Surely the bank takes adequate precautions. I'm well, sure I have a that. gun and there's an alarm system, but... Oh, you see. Well, the thing is, I'm all alone. Hmm? Sometimes when I'm sitting there at my desk, I think how easy it would be. Why? Well, all somebody would have to do is... Shoot me through the glass door. <laughs> Even if the alarm rang, it would be ten minutes before the police got there. Well, oh, Mr. Hubbard, after all, it's a very quiet community, no one. Well, uh, I guess that's what the directors of the bank figure. Only possible danger I can see would be from from too many people knowing what you've told me. I mean, wrong people. Mm. You say you don't talk, so... Oh, no. No, Reverend Pierce, I've never told a soul except mm -hmm. you. See, that's faith, McKillop. I, I see I did a lot without faith, but, but not without faith in my own shining destiny. Imagine, out of all this community, 35,000 people, Hubbard, picked me, me, to share his secret. <clears throat> he even told me the truck didn't come for the money until 9.30 at night. As soon as Hubbard had gone, I wrote a letter to Mac. You remember, I'd, I told Mac to wait for me in Chicago, and, and in that letter, I explained the setup, and I asked him to be at the bank at 9 p.m. on the 30th. Well, and... 
meantime, I, I continue to play my saintly part. <laughs> it was easy, warmed by adulation, warmed by love, yes, love. Because even you could see what was happening to your daughter, your own very beautiful daughter. Lucy, yes, she, she fell in love with me. <laughs> and believe me, Lucy was a great help to me, blinded by what she called love. If I made a slip, she was there to help me cover up. And what did I feel? Love? With Lucy, as long as the word love served me, I used it. But last week, on Wednesday, when I came in the evening to read to you, I, I suddenly realized that it could also be a source of great danger. Howard, Howard, darling. <laughs> You're all I've waited for all day. Let me look at you, Lucy. Say you look so happy. Howard, I have the most wonderful news. Guess. How can I guess? Well, I, I, I've never breathed a word to Father about us. Well, you and me, you know, because you asked me not to. Well, not until he can talk to I'm us. I'm sure and you didn't. His blessing. No, not yet I haven't, but the doctor was here today. Yes? And he told me Father will speak again soon, any day now. Well. Doctor doesn't know why he hasn't already. Mm. Well, isn't that wonderful? Yes, and yes, it is. Howard, what's the matter? Nothing is the matter. Well, there is, I can see. Well, look, Lucian, I was going to tell you before, you see, I can't marry you, not ever. You can't? Please, don't ask me why. It's because you don't love me. Believe me, Lucy, you, you just have to go on and live your life as, as if you'd never met me. As if I'd never met you. You know what that means? Whatever it means. It means I'll marry Tom Hubbard and you'll well, perform the service. Yes. You'll be the one to make me Mrs. Tom Hubbard. Mrs. who? Who did you say? Tom Hubbard. I'll be a banker's wife. What? <laughs> Never knew his name before. Any. Well, no matter what you think, Lucy, I, I'm sure you'll be happy. <laughs> I have to go in and see your father now, Lucy, and try to be brave, will you? <laughs> Good evening, Reverend McKillop. Oh, you poor, voiceless, brainless, harmless old Reverend McKillop. I, I hear you may be able to talk again, yes. I, I hear someday you're going to speak. Well, I have only one week to wait, that's all, one week. And, but you are a danger. Therefore, I ought to kill you, Reverend. I, I ought to kill you now. Don't ask me why I didn't kill you, Reverend McKillop. I, I suppose it will always be distasteful to me. It's a, it's a job for cruder minds, and, and if it happens that my neat habits turn in a good deed now and then, that doesn't make me a boy scout, does it? I might not like to think of Lucy only, only two days married, so soon to be a widow, so, so soon in half an hour, yes, because. In half an hour, Mac is going to shoot Tom Hubbard as he sits at his desk. And in half an hour, I'll have $200,000 and I'll be free, you hear? Well, Reverend... Now that you know the real Philip Gentry, do you understand? Do you? No, I doubt it. I, I doubt if you, with your good book and, and your years of tending the good sheep in the rich green pastures here, could ever understand one-tenth of what a man like me feels. Doesn't matter. I don't need your understanding. I don't. Good night, Reverend, and... And sleep well. Who? Who is it? It's 
It's me, Reverend Pierce, Tom. Oh, let me in. Reverend Pierce, just a minute. I wanted to make sure. You see, this is the night when the truck yes, comes. Yes, yes, I remember. That's how I knew where to find you. Oh. Well, did you want something? Yes. Lucy's feeling sick. I, I came to send you home. L- Lucy? But I, I can't. I have to stay. I can stay for you. Oh, gee, I don't know. I'm supposed to stay until the truck Lucy's gets here. calling for you, Tom. She's really sick? Yes. Well, all right. I I guess with you here, it'll be all right. Just tell me what to do. Well, uh, that's the money right there already in those sacks. Yes. I sit here? Yeah, yeah right at this desk. And... Mm. Gee, I... I don't know what the directors will Come think. Come on, run along, Tom. They'll never know. Even if someone walks by from the outside, they'll never know if it's if it's you or me sitting here. I didn't mean to I shoot. Know you. Look, you better go. I... I'm dying, man. I, I ain't gonna leave you here, Gentry. What do you think? Yes, you. You are going to leave me. They won't get me, Mac. I... <laughs> I'm dying, man. You go on now. I... Only you won't be able to take the money. To... Yeah. The plan is all changed. Yeah, okay, that, that doesn't matter, the, the money. Remember me when... when thou comest... into thy kingdom. Hey, hey, what are you talking about, Gentry? It's from the Bible, Mac. You wouldn't know it. Uh, uh, it's from the Bible, yes. It was said by, by a thief... This, dear friends, was the man Philip Gentry, or Reverend Pierce, or whatever other name he may choose in eternity, the man whom we bury today. That night when he stood above my bed, pouring defiance and bitterness into my ears, thinking I was paralyzed, I could both speak and write. My paralysis had been gone for many days. But I did not speak, because I knew what Philip Gentry would do, what he had to do. I knew what he denied, that to accomplish work as he had in God's vineyard, a man must have faith, even though he deny that faith. That is why, in spite of all, he protected my daughter's happiness. That is why he could not kill me. For the work he did here had molded him in spite of himself, into a man who is truly a servant of God. To such a man our Lord would say, Verily I say unto you, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. week, the makers of Camel cigarettes send free camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Wood, Wisconsin, U.S. AAF Station Hospital, Langley Field, Hampton, Virginia, U.S. Naval Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee, U.S. Marine Hospital, Cleveland, Ohio, and Veterans Hospital, Aspenwall, Pennsylvania. More people are smoking camels than ever before, and many of those people are doctors. When three leading independent research organizations asked 113,597 doctors, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? 
The brand named most was Camel. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you The Mask of Medusa by Nelson Bond, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Why do you smoke a pipe? For pleasure, of course. Then get the tobacco especially made for smoking pleasure, Prince Albert. Ask for mellow, mild Prince Albert the next time you buy tobacco for your pipe. And the extra pleasure you'll enjoy will tell you why more pipes smoke P.A. than any other tobacco. Prince Albert's choice tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. Ask for Prince Albert. See if Prince Albert doesn't give you more pipe enjoyment. Listen in on Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry Saturday night for a half hour of folk music and laughs with Red Foley and his Cumberland Valley Boys, Minnie Pearl, the gossip from Grinder Switch, Rod Brassfield, and the rest of the Opry gang. And as Red's special guests, you'll hear Cowboy Copus and Barefoot Brownie. Remember, Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night over NBC. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Laurie in Mystery in the Air. The artists supporting Mr. Laurie tonight were Henry Morgan as the voice of mystery, Peggy Weber as Lucy, John Brown as Reverend McKillop, Howard Culver as Mac, Jack Edwards Jr. as Hubbard, and Russell Thorson as Reverend Pierce. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you a pleasant good night for Camel. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs>